Hey everybody, good morning, happy Friday. It is time to get into the Word of God. This is Pastor Sean Bowman bringing to you once again the inspired, infallible Word of God. Hallelujah. There's Sherry Sievertson and Chase Roberts. Welcome, Chase. How are you? Good to have you. So blessed to have Brother Terry. Good to be have you be on today. Welcome, welcome. Where's Oli, Sherry? Paige Buckeye, I tried calling you yesterday. How are you doing? Wayne Oliver, praying for that house to sell. Welcome, Mary Pat. Good morning to you guys. So nice to have you guys. Hey, hop on, get on, grab your coffee. It's Friday. It's Friday. We try to land big on Friday because I want to keep you guys rocking and rolling into Sunday. Find a good church. Get plugged into a good church. It's time to get plugged back in. Man, am I excited. I'm so excited. I got to give a little promo. We're going to have the best, the best Lenten series we've ever had, ever in this church. The best, the best, the best, the best, the best, the best. These are these are the Bible studies. And um, look at that. It's going to be just an awesome, awesome stuff I've got. Every single book, I've got like three, four, five questions. And then I got some other questions in the, in the back on the Lord's Prayer that tied right into Jesus' teaching on Matthew 6 to Matthew 26. Jesus, do you know that Jesus was literally praying the Lord's Prayer as he sweat drops of blood just before they crucified him? Yes! It's good to get your arms around the Lord's Prayer. And we got questions that are taking us right down the Via Della Rosa, right into Easter. Easter is right around the corner. It's time to get our hearts ready for that. We're, we got the best, the best Lenten Bible studies ready to rock. It's going to be fun. Oh, man. I'm just giving a big promo here, but let's get let's get our hands on that. We'll send them out to you. Well, guess what? We now have a COVID section roped off for 50 people. So you're going to be safe. Oli, hi. Good to have you, brother. Here we got Oli, Jean and Shirley, Paige, Donna Sloan, Donna and Jean. Donna and Jean Sloan, good to see you guys. Yes, you're my favorite Donna and Jean. Yes, yes, there's only one Donna and Jean. And I appreciate you guys so today we're going to get into um we're going to get into the word if you got your bibles turn to psalm 15 psalm 15 we're going to deal with the question that you've all wrestled with from time to time we're missing a few people right now but i hope they get on looking for lulu uh looking for who else brother brian where's brother brian oh i know what's going on and my own mother where's my mother i give you guys permission to give her grief if we don't see her pop on. Uh, hit share, hit like. Let's get these people out of bed. It's time to get your cup of coffee. I got my caribou. It's nice and hot, ready to go. Are you hungry for God's word today? Let's get going. I want to ask you a question, a serious question as we think about the word of God. Why does God allow Suffering. I mean, he's got the control of everything. What's God doing when we have to suffer? Have you ever asked that question? You ever been there? I think this is the, the, the single greatest challenge to the Christian faith. The amount of suffering and the, the distribution seems to be random and unfair why? Why is there such pain? It outrages and bewilders people that are going through it, especially if, you, if you're not deeply grounded in the doctrine of God's grace. You can, you can turn a, a, a sour heart towards God in a quick hurry. Theologians and philosophers, they've wrestled with this question for centuries. And the mystery of undeserved suffering remains. When I went to seminary and uh, had an opportunity to suffer a little there, 
<laughs> I did it for you guys, just for the record. God was calling me into it, so what do you do? I mean, what do you do? If you're a Christian and God calls you into it, you go. I went. And by God's grace, I made it through seminary. Hallelujah. But when I was in seminary, I'll never forget one of my professors said this. When it comes to why, God, why would you allow this? Why did you do this? He said, there's going to be a lot of answers. Some may be good. Some may be not so good. But the best answer is this. When we get into glory, God will answer your question completely and fully. In the meantime, living under the shadow of the cross in God's grace will suffice and get us through. That's what I, I was told in seminary. I, I kind of lean on that. But I think this psalm is going to give us, it's going to fill in some holes for us today because sometimes we need something a little bit deeper, a little bit more tangible. Today, tomorrow, passages are only part of the answer, but each of them gives us insight so that we can draw closer to the to the to the heart of God. And no matter where you're at in life, no matter what age you are, you've experienced suffering. We see that all uh, all through the scriptures. We see it all through life. And we see that although suffering is never good in itself, God is able to use it for good in a number of ways. God literally will take suffering, suffering of an individual, suffering of a family, even suffering of a nation. And he can use it for his glory, his good. What's God ultimately doing? He's pivoting our eyes towards the the the. the the message of the cross, which is three words, God loves you. Three words, God loves you. Your suffering is also God's suffering. We see all through the scriptures that when, when you cry, God cries. When you cry, God collects every tear in a bottle. When you cry, God is right with you. God never leaves you. When your heart is breaking, when you have nowhere to turn, God says, call on my name and I will be there for you. God suffers alongside of you. He does not always remove your suffering in life. Now, why doesn't he do that? I don't know. God will tell you when you get there. In the meantime, don't lose the faith. Keep looking to God. God sometimes uses the bad things in life that happen to us, that ought not happen to anybody, that you wouldn't want to happen to your worst enemies. God will use bad things sometimes to bring about good in your life. Let's take a look at Psalm 15, 1 to 5. Psalm 15, 1 to 5. Reading in Jesus' name. Lord, who may dwell in the sacred tent, who may live on your holy mountain. Interesting way to start. The one whose walk is blameless, who does, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from the heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor, who casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. All right, we're going to take a look at this today. Because this text is really, God is telling us in this text in, in Psalm 15, God uses 
your suffering to transform you. He does. What do you mean, Pastor Sean? I wouldn't be your pastor today if I hadn't have went through the most gut-wrenching loss of the two people who raised me from birth, my grandparents. They were my mom and dad growing up. I saw them as my dad, my mother. I, I, I saw my grandmother as my best friend. She prayed for me every day. She drove me to football, basketball, hairs in a curler, told me all of her crazy stories. I am my grandparents' son. So much so that they had me in the will until the last month. And then my grandpa took me out. I'll never really know why, but I was taken out. God knows. God knew exactly what he was doing. And then I was engaged. been dating a girl since I was practically a junior in high school. Six years. It's a long time. She broke up with me. Lost my parents. Lost my inheritance. Lost my fiance. Just as I was graduating from college. Pastor Sean was at the very bottom of his rope. Literally. I really didn't want to live anymore. Life sucked. It was hard. But God used those unbelievable, heart-wrenching things. In fact, do I dare say this? That was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. What? You crazy Bowman? Yeah. It helped me, first of all. It helped me to break away from goofy, sick, twisted, dysfunctional thinking, a love for the world, a love for human secularism. I didn't know Jesus. But in that, I was so broken, so offended. I was so angry at everybody. Finally, God helped me realize if those things hadn't have happened, I couldn't have saved you, Sean. I couldn't have opened your eyes to the greater good of what I want to do in your life, which is I want you to preach Christ. I'd have been living on some little dunged out farmstead up in Maddock, North Dakota. Nothing wrong with Maddock. But I'd have been up there trying to scratch out a living on a few acres that maybe I got inherited from my grandpa. Oh, man. God had a better plan for me. He called me into something called surrender after I was broken. He fed me the word of God. Came to me when I was growing up. Sat dormant in my rocky hard soil. But God used it. He used the worst suffering of my life to save my soul and to help me to see how unbelievably important a personal, real, surrendered, born-again relationship to Jesus Christ. About four years later, I, I surrendered my life to Jesus. I knew I was on a weird and freaky journey after that. And because of that, I'm now your pastor. Because of that suffering, I get to be your pastor. For some of you, you don't worship here on Sunday. You live 20 states away from me but I'm your electronic pastor and I pray for you. I declare to you the word of God. And there's been times in your life that have been tough because of the circumstances you've had to go through. There have been times in your life where I know you have felt shaken like I was. Times when you lost your, your bearing, you felt tempted that you wanted to give up. 
Today's psalm reminds us that you need never be shaken in verse 5. Underline verse 5. You need never be shaken. Even in times of suffering, remember, David described the kind of life that God intended you to lead. The, the, the guidelines he gives are, are things that you can hold on to during the difficult times. Get your pen, get a piece of paper, take some notes. Because I want you to get this. Because you're all going to suffer. You're all going to go through hard times. The only difference between after this day, when you're hearing this story, and the times before is, you're going to know that you have a life preserver, a safety valve, someone that's with you that absolutely 100% will get you through. Jesus will put his life on the line for that statement because he will get you through. So here we go. The guidelines that God gives all of us, the things you can hold on to during your difficult times. First of all, take a look. If you got your Bible still open, keep looking down at your Bible. I know, Sherry, you got yours open. Underline this to take a little note. Number one, as we see in verse two, A, when things are all falling apart and you want to act like a complete lunatic, I did. I mean, you've lost everything. Why not? Who cares? Well, whatever. I've seen people like that before. Some people are like that now after the election. Other people were like that after the last election. We see, number one, act right. Act right. It says in verse 2a, seek to walk blamelessly and do what is right. Does that make sense? You, you act right. Do what you are, what, what the God, word of God calls you to do, even though you don't feel it. Remember, the heart is deceitful above all things who can trust it. You have to throw the switch into autopilot and trust that the Holy Spirit will bring you through. Your mind is messed up. Your heart is destroyed. You, you see no hope, no, no future in front of you. you. You are distraught. You are destroyed. And you have to flip the switch. You get to flip the switch because you are a born-again Christian. You've surrendered your life to Jesus. You close your eyes. You reach out. He takes your hand and he leads you through the valley of the shadow of death. Yeah, I'm preaching to you. Because like I say, I've preached this song to me once or twice. He'll walk you through. Number two, number two. We find it in verse 2b. Underline this. Tell the truth. Quit lying to yourself. Quit lying to others. Quit telling white lies. It isn't helping. Speak the truth from your heart. That's number two. Speak the truth from your heart. Guess what? Those that have gone through pain before, and we all have, we come alongside of you. We love you through it because we are the body of Christ. That's why it's so important to get yourself to church. Don't ever believe the lie that you can do church at home for the rest of your life. That's the devil's talk. The body has to come together physically. Because Jesus mends wounds through other brothers and sisters. And he does it through the gospel. You speaking the gospel through someone else who loves you and you love them. The church doesn't just come together on Sunday. It comes together all week long. But find a good church, brothers and sisters who are in other states. Then we see number three. Verse three even. Do not gossip. Do not let your lips put negative, destructive construction, destruction on another person. Listen to the Bible. It says in verse 3, let no slander come from your... It's a little instrument, smallest one in the body, but it, it moves the ship. And if you're guilty of it, confess your sin now, now. There's no way you can control your tongue if you don't confess your sin of gossip. God, forgive me. I do gossip. Oh, God, help me. So what we do, 
I mean, we just gotta be honest, right? Let's just be honest, lay it all out. You think God's like, what? I didn't know. No, God knows. He knows you. He created you. He knows how you think, how you act. He knows every pivot. So why not just be honest, be real in front of God, call out to a brother or a sister in Christ, confess it, be real, be free. Freedom comes when you're real honest. All right. Number four. Do not hurt your neighbor. Do not hurt your neighbor. Write that down. Number three was do not gossip. Number four, do not hurt your neighbor. Look at verse three. It says, do your neighbors no wrong. When I first moved to Jamestown, I used to start my snowblower. And I'd go you know, back when we used to get lots of snow. Thank you, Jesus. There's one good thing about 2021. We have a very little snow here, like traces, none. Thank you, Jesus. I needed something good this winter. We'll take that. I used to start, start my snowblower and I'd blow my way right over to my neighbor. Finally, one day, my, <laughs> my neighbor sticks his head out the door and he's like, why do you always blow out my driveway or my, my, my sidewalk and come on, what are you doing? And I said, doesn't the Bible say you're supposed to love your neighbor and be good to him? Oh, I guess it does. I'm like, I'm just trying to be good to you. True story. He's like, okay, thank you. <laughs> love it. So do good things to your neighbor. Verse three, number five, write this one down. Keep your word. Keep your promises. Even when it hurts, verse 4b, this means doing whatever you've committed to do even when it does not suit you. Just because it does not suit you anymore, if you said you're going to do something, people are watching and you know what's at stake? Your Christian witness. Do it. If you said you're going to do it, do it. A particular challenge for our generation when a, a simple text message can, can cancel an arrangement of, of any um, agreement that you've made with someone. How about this? Just say, I'll be there. I said I would do it. I will do it. Let your Bible says, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Here's another one. Verse 5a. Be generous. Be generous. We live in a, a very self-focused society right now. So your generosity counts. If you lend money, don't charge excess of interest. And by the way, the Bible says in Proverbs, if you lend out money, don't expect to get paid back. Really. Look at 5B. Uh, be honest. Never take bribes. Never take bribes. As our character begins to transform in these ways, my brothers and sisters, use these things I've talked about as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You're dying to yourself. You're being made new in Christ. You're trusting. Hey, I've never given Jesus a chance. I've never really put my complete faith in him. I've never really, really just said, close my eyes, reach my hand out, said, Jesus, take my hand, lead me through this. I've never done it like that, but I'm going to try it now because Pastor Sean says it really works. It does. And as he takes your hand, as he walks you through the valley of the shadow of death, you're going to have a lot of voices saying a lot of things, but only listen to Jesus. You know my story about that. When my wife said, husband, how can I trust you? I can't even trust myself. You're going to learn one thing about me. I only trust Jesus. Like my son says when he goes into his British accent, yeah, yeah, good man. Amen. By the way, you got to go on to Victory VLC Jamestown on YouTube or on the Facebook page, the Victory Facebook page. Check out my, my Oli and Lena. Oh, wait, I went Hans because I already know an Oli. Uh, 
my oh, my I I have a Hans and Lena uh, a little skit. You'll love it. Check it out. So as our character begins to transform in these ways, these difficult times that you're going through, you just even though it doesn't feel right, even though you don't want to do them, you I've given you these these very things which you can do, these seven things that you can just do them. Go into autopilot. Let Jesus walk you through. This is the valley of the shadow of death. Do them. And keep praying and saying, Jesus, help me. That's all you got to say. Jesus, help me. Read a psalm. Two, three verses. Jesus, help me. And in these seven things I just walked you through, do them. And your character will start to transform in unbelievable ways. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's going to happen for me. It was over 25 years ago. Closer to 30, I suppose now. God's been changing me. For you too. God's been changing you. Difficult circumstances and suffering have less of a uh, disabil disabilitating impact on us when we know that there is a higher power, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who's bringing us through. And as David notes, those who do these things, 5C, look at verse 5C, will not be shaken. Say that with me one more time, everyone out loud. Will not be shaken. Actually, it says in verse 5C, will never be shaken. Woo! You can dwell in the sanctuary of the Lord. Verse 1. Why? Because you put your faith in him. You walk through suffering. You, you followed these things that I just shared with you. And he started to cement in your very spirit an opportunity to lock and load with the love of God, the truth of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God. And he started transforming you. And, and, and in your times of suffering, he led you to a character transformation that you could never have done on yourself. People are saying, you're different. This character transformation leads you to a knowledge of a, a secure hope and experience of God's love. Take a look, write this down, Romans 5, 3 through 5. This is the transformation that God led you to, to understand the love of God. In Romans 5, 3 through 5, the Lord gives you that, that open-eyed wisdom so that you can now live in a supernatural hope and love that are greater than anything that you had before. And when you live in God's love and God's hope, you have a stabilizing force within you that you know that you know that you know that no matter what you're facing, no matter what your suffering and your uncertainty is, you know that you know that the one who holds heaven together, the one who made the heavens and the earth, the one who designed you in your mother's womb, the one who has it all in control, he is the lover of your soul and you know him and love him. He's got you. He's bringing you through. Yes, he is. Now here's what I want you to say. On the count of three, amen. Count of three, one, two, three. Amen, yes, give it to me. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Let's see, what am I doing? Time. Oh, man. Tell Dwight I got done in 20 minutes. No, don't do that. I need to get a little quicker at this because I bloviate too much, but I give him permission to give me a hard time. It's so nice to have you today. God bless you guys. Love you. Lord loves you. This is our Friday. I landed big on Friday for you. For you. Because I want you to go into Sunday fired up, loving Jesus, ready to rock. And then, until next week, Conan will bring you his little word on Monday. Try to bless him, encouraging him. He's just getting going in this church stuff. God's, God's doing a work in this guy. Came out here from Wisconsin, or Washington, learning. He's getting, he's under the fire hose. He's learning, but he's doing a good job. And then on Tuesday, we'll get rolling. Get into the word. God will meet you between now and then every day through his word. Until then, Jesus 
is crazy in love with you. Pastor Sean loves you. You love each other. That's what we call the church when we love each other unconditionally through Christ. Until next week, thank you for joining me. This is Pastor Sean Bowman. God bless you guys. Have a great worship time on Sunday. We'll see you next week.